You're done with your Oreo? <laughs> yeah, done with my Oreo. Okay, good. Um, do we really know what happened? Really the brother did. did. The brother, that's what I thought too. I mean, that seems like kind of obvious. Hey, do you want to talk, talk about death? death? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm just murdery, 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 murdery. Okay, let's do this. It's going. Okay. It's going. Yeah. It's happening. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. Okay. All right. Let's do it. All right. All right. Okay, Bobby. All right, all right, all right. All right. Welcome to Mystery Murder Thing, y'all. Oh, God. <laughs> That's how Matthew McConaughey would welcome you to our podcast. Um, yes. Do you think I could get Matthew McConaughey to do the intro for our podcast if I told him I'm also from Texas? Yeah, if that That's and all half a million dollars. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so like, how much is it to book? How much? How much is Lincoln paying you? <laughs> of a ten-second audio bit. <laughs> Those Lincoln commercials are weird, though. Have you seen those? The Tennessee whiskey commercials. No, the Lincoln commercials. Oh, he also does Tennessee whiskey commercials. Mm, pretty sure he does Wild Turkey. Oh. You're probably right. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's alcohol. Wild turkey. <laughs> it is some. Ca- it's an alcohol. It's a luxury car brand. Do they go together? Not Hopefully at all. Hopefully not. Hopefully not. Not unless we. Not until we get self-driving cars. <laughs> then people can drink in their car. That's your goal, isn't it? Yep. I'm looking yeah. forward to it. Mario doesn't like to drive. It's true. And he'd rather just sit in a self-driving car. I'd rather let like a machine a train do it or a plane. Yeah, exactly. I mean. They've it, machines have been driving planes for a long time, so I, it's not that weird of a thing if you like really think about it. And I was telling you about the autonomous um, delivery robots, which is a great idea. It is. It is. I'm pretty sure it was George Mason University that they were um, rolling it out in. <laughs> pun intended. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that was that was pretty cool. I don't even remember. Where, I think it was like a. Washington Post article or in the Atlantic or something. I can't remember. Anywho, not what we're talking about this week. <laughs> and you said you don't know what I'm talking about. I actually don't. Okay, I'll just go first, okay? Okay. 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 So I am talking about the uh, poisoning Yee! of a young lady named Zhu Ling. That's, mm, poisonings are scary. Yeah, so this, and this one is is really, it's kind of weird. It's like, sort of captivated the mind of, of like, a lot of people since it happened in, in 1994, 1995, um, especially in China, where, where it happened. So, like, okay, so this was in late 1994 in uh, Tsinghua University, which is one of, the, like, the most pr- prominent universities in, in, uh, in China, um, and it's in Beijing. So um, one of the, like, most promising, you know, dynamic kind of students – coming up in um, the physical chemistry program in Tsinghua University was uh, this young woman named Zhu Ling. So she was really smart, really outgoing, like really popular, um, known as like a, a really um, like musically inclined, fun, you know, kind um. of person. And unfortunately, at the end of 1994, she falls like suddenly and kind of weirdly ill. Like, no one's totally sure what's happening to her. But she starts getting these, like, horrible stomach pains. Her hair starts falling out. Oh, my god! Like, something really bad is obviously going on. So some of those hairs that fell out, though, were collected, and that's going to come back later on. She was eventually hospitalized at Tongren Hospital, where she appeared to be recovering after a few weeks of, of just kind of, like, recuperating in the hospital. But there was no real identification of what the cause of it was at that point. No no one, everyone was, like, very, very perplexed by it. And eventually, um, Ling returned back to, to Tsinghua University to re, to um, uh, restart her studies the, the next semester. But by March of 1995, things had taken a turn for the worse again. And, okay. it, and actually even worse. Um, so she kind of had, like, she, like, kind of got better. But then... Right, right. She got better, and then she kind of had a relapse. And um, when it came back, it returned, like, way worse than before. She was now experiencing not only the stomach pains and the hair loss, but also leg pain, loss of muscular eye control, (gasps) partial face paralysis, and she eventually needed a respirator to be able to breathe. Oh, my God. So, yeah, it, it just, like... 
something, whatever was going on, was just, like, shutting down the functionings of her body somehow. And doctors were initially very puzzled by what, 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 what this was. And a uh, sort of collaborative approach was, was taken um, because the doctors there at Tongren Hospital, which I believe is where she was taken to again, um, just were, were not really equipped to solve this puzzle by themselves. And one of the doctors that was brought in early on was uh, Dr. Li Shunwei at uh, Peking University, uh, sorry, Peking Union Medical College Hospital. Oh. Excuse me. Uh, P-U-M-C-H. Um, and he recalled a poisoning case that he had previously had that seemed a lot like what was happening to Ling. And he suggested that this was a case of thallium poisoning. Uh, thallium being like a, I believe it's called a heavy metal. Damn. Um, and Ling um, stated, and, and the investigation confirmed that the, the university did, that she was not in regular contact with thallium because, you know, she was a physical chemistry major, so it's not, like, oh, out so, of the realm of okay. possibility that okay. that could have happened, right, in one of the labs or something. But they looked into it, and, and it just was not the case. So the, um, the, the lack of, you know, this kind of, like, trail to thallium caused the doctors initially to dismiss this theory, of thallium poisoning being the case. They instead determined that it was probably this thing called Guillain Barr syndrome uh, instead and, and treated her for that. But it didn't work. The was treatment it, had it, no effect. So it was thallium poisoning? Or we don't we'll, know? We'll, we'll get to that. Okay. Um, so Ling continues to get worse. Obviously, the treatment they're giving her for the Guillain Barr syndrome is not working. Um, and when this treatment was unsuccessful, and in the you know sort of collaborative spirit right of the of the investigation, doctors turned to a what was then a brand new tool, uh, which was available only to an elite few researchers in Chinese academia, which was the internet. Were just kind of a brand new thing at that time, oh, especially right, in China. Right. So um, how long how long had she, has she been sick at this point by now? This is a few months. So okay. her initial bout of sickness was in late 1994. Now this is March, April, moving into the you know the middle part of 1995, um, and in fact, the, what I'm c kind of specifically talking about here in terms of turning to the internet was in April of 1995. Okay. Uh, two of Ling's friends, Kai uh, Quan Ching, and Bai Ji Chang, students at Peking University, posted on some of the what were called Usenet groups, um, you know, kind of like an early chat room kind of thing on uh, April 10th, 1995. And this pro proved to be a really fateful day in, in the case. This was kind of like a turning point. So what they um, described on those Usenet groups was basically what Ling's symptoms were and um, what the course of treatment had been so far. And they received just kind of an outpouring of response. Um, okay. which isn't what I necessarily would have thought, you know, I mean, the early internet, but I guess think pe people were just so into this, you know, it was like yeah. they, they jumped on any chance to, to utilize it. And this is generally considered the first use of telemedicine, um, telemedicine. which, which of course now is, is like a, a very regular thing, you know, what's wait, what's that telemedicine it's is just like is, telling somebody what's wrong over the internet. Yeah, you, utilizing the internet to access medical resources that one would not normally be able to access. Oh, okay. So, for example, I just started a new job, and they have a service where you can message with or or even, like, FaceTime with a, a, a doctor, a real doctor oh. or a nurse. And they will look at, you know, like, hey, I've got this mole, like do I need to go to the doctor? Or, like, I have a rash. Like, what is this? Or I ju I've had, like, a cough for 10 days. Like, and they can prescribe you antibiotics over the phone. And that's, like, that's a thing. That's really... I didn't know that was a thing. I know, I'm right? I'm learning things today. But apparently the seeds of that were planted <clears throat> way back in 1995, like, in, in the, <coughs> the mid-'90s. So, you know, it's something that, um, I guess, has been, been around for a while, although not, you know, s super... Um, there's not a lot of uh, consciousness about it. So uh, this aspect of the case, the kind of like telemedicine portion of it, really helped to give this case more notoriety as well. It really like grabbed headlines in China and um, also sowed the groundwork for 
the enduring power that this case would have in Chinese media and and in the Chinese public consciousness. Um, sort of in a similar way to, although not as sensationalized as the Jean Bonnet case in the United States, right, in a lot of places, it, th- this is the case that, that really, like, stayed with people and, and had a staying power that just most cases did not have. Um, so uh, Ling's two friends, right, uh, Quan Cheng and, and Zhu Cheng, um, sorted the about 1,500 posts that they got, wow. you know, re- responses, basically, that they got to their query. And so this, the, like, went, went viral exactly. in 1995 terms. Exactly. For, for 1995, this went very much viral. And the plurality of the posts agreed with the thallium poisoning hypothesis and recommended a common antidote for it, Prussian blue. The, which is? Uh, which is a, a, actually something that's used as a dye. But um, it's also apparently an antidote for thallium poisoning. That's yeah, kind of funny kind of, how that works. Kind of strange. You wouldn't think it's, that necessarily. Yeah, it's, <laughs> uh, it's not like super intuitive, but apparently that's, that's what it is. Um, testing also confirmed that Prussian blue um, was the, the correct uh, course of treatment <laughs> because more than 10,000 times the normal amount of thallium was found to be present in Ling's body. Oh, my God. So, yeah, which your question was familiar, yes, they they did eventually confirm that thallium poisoning was the cause. And while this, you know, kind of clever use of collaborative medicine um, did save Ling's life, she certainly would have died if they had not oh, administered the, the antidote. She, okay. No, she, she's still living now. That's good. Um, she was permanently affected um, in a very, very... Uh, profound and negative way. She, first of all, suffered serious neurological damage um, to the point where sources described her as having the cognitive capacity of a normal six-year-old oh, no. for, the, for the rest of her life. Um, her parents have been care- basically caring for her night and day for, for since then, for the past 25 years. Um, they're now like in their 70s. Um, Ling also cannot speak. Um, she's largely paralyzed, and she's almost blind. Oh my so her gosh. her quality of life, as you can imagine, is is severely compromised. Yeah. Um, although she she was able to, you know, remain living. She she's off of a respirator. Or, you know, she doesn't require like that level of of care necessarily. Right. Right. But um, yeah, it's it's very intense. Um, so once the poisoning was confirmed and. Just, you know, to kind of um, mark it, it's May 1995 now. Um, the Beijing police began to investigate what was obviously an intentional poisoning. Yeah. However, little was made public, and there was no real explanation of, you know, what was going on with the case. Um, and apparently this was kind of the modus operandi of the police, I think more widely in China, but also in Beijing at that time. They didn't there really just was no sense of like communicate with the no, public or anything. Not not nothing like that really um, on a on a regular basis. That that was my that was what I was given to understand from from what I was reading and what I've previously read and and heard about the justice system in China. And it was actually not until January of two thousand and six, so about eleven years later, that the police finally revealed publicly that no suspect was found in the initial investigation. Okay, great. It, t- okay, it took uh, them 11 awesome. years? We kind of already knew that because, uh, well, you didn't arrest You'd anybody think, or anything, yeah. right? But sure. They, so they finally at least admitted that. And that same month in January of 2006, the principal investigator, uh, a man named Li Shudsen, hinted that the police knew more, but that the information would be, quote, too sensitive to release. What? What not, does that mean? Not totally clear what that means. Now, I would say that there are instances, for example, in the United States where our government will say, you know, the we, we can't bring this prosecution because it would compromise a larger prosecution that's ongoing, right? Or investigation that's ongoing. Or it would reveal state secrets. Or it would reveal yeah. sources and methods, you know, that would compromise confidential sources, all of that is yeah. is perfectly legitimate. That That's makes sense. part of the nuance of, you know, why we give prosecutors so much leeway, right? Prosecutorial yeah. 
discretion. But that does not seem to be necessarily what's going on here. It's not clear what is going on here, but it seems to be something untoward. I can't say that for sure. No one can. But it's Ooh. it's fishy. It seems fishy. Yeah. Whatever is going on here, whatever reason why nothing came of this case, it seems pretty fishy. Yeah. And again, that's another reason why this case is, has remained such, so of such a high profile um, for such a long time in, in China. Okay. So just to kind of um, get back into it here. Um, the... Okay, so the suspicions, although no charges were ever brought, pretty much only and and definitely initially fell on um, this other student named Sun Wai. And Sun Wai was one of Ling's roommates, okay? And she was also suspected because, according to Tsinghua University, she was the only student connected to Zhu Ling who had official access to thallium. Because, again, she was another physical oh. chemistry student. So she had the key or whatever, yeah. you know, to where they kept these dangerous uh, substances. The university and, and eventually denied why the ability to graduate. So they, they felt that there was enough smoke here that, that they, you know, that they could d- deny oh, her, wow. her. You know, she basically wasn't allowed to get her certificate. And... Um, they also did did some other things, but um, nothing really ever necessarily happened to her. Um, that was that bad, though. There she, wasn't she any was like concrete damage. Not evidence. really. No, she she was briefly detained by the police for about eight hours, um, and she was forced to acknowledge that she was considered a suspect. They made her like sign a paper that that said that, but that was like literally it, and then she was just released. And nothing else really ever came of it. Um, some people have claimed that this was because of her family's reported political connections. Uh, the family denies this. The police deny it. She denies it. But there's a lot of sus- suspicion around this. Mm, maybe she um, has some, like, inside people. Yeah, and, that, and that's what I was just about to get into. Um, her grandfather is uh, Sun Yu uh, Wai Chi. And I'm butchering all of these Chinese names, and I do apologize, but I, I just have no idea, so I'm just doing my best. Um, an, uh, who was an important Communist Party member, and her first cousin was the deputy mayor of Beijing, and also a high-ranking party member. Oh, okay. So yeah, she, she had some high high connections. Furthermore, some of my sources argue that, especially at this time, in, in like 1995, this was before the rule of law was like even nominally followed in China. That um, the the way we why was was treated was sort of indicative of a doubled standard, right? That if she were not well connected, they say she would have probably been forced to confess, even if she were oh, innocent. Oh, it would have been like the opposite type of exactly treatment. The 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 the, the fact that she was treated. S- the exact opposite way of, of what we would expect sort of seems to suggest some... Kind of lends merit to the yeah, whole fishy side of... There's some collusion high going politics on here. Yeah, exactly. Um, especially under these circumstances, you know, where there's yeah, like she's not like really... a psychopath or something or what? <laughs> we have no idea. And I really cannot say anything about you know, her guilt or innocence or... Because we just don't know, right? We just have no idea. And, and you know, part of that is because they didn't do the investigation, it seems, <laughs> you know? So, yeah, she probably should have been investigated more, but they didn't do it, so I have no evidence to base anything on. Um, and and what, what's all... What further um, kind of points to this being such a weird situation is that at this time she would have been presumed guilty. The presumption of innocence wasn't introduced into Chinese uh, legal theory until the next year in 1996. So it, at this time she would have actually been presumed guilty and the police presumably would have had, should have had some positive reason to presume her or show her to be innocent. And that there's just not, there's she's no, not there. Yeah, the, there's certainly nothing like that. I mean, she had the means, right? Yeah. Because she had access to the poison and access to the victim. 
um, she had a plausible motive that, you know, Zhu Ling was a more popular student, a better, you know, academic student than her, and, and she felt jealous of her in some way. We can certainly construct a plausible motive from that. Um, and she certainly had the opportunity. So, you know... But... She seems like the best suspect. There's it, no one else. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, but... So it's just so weird that they ran away from her. I just feel like thallium poisoning, that's so calculative and, like, so... That's, like, evil. It is very evil. Like, and and we'll... a heavy metal? Yeah. Come on. It's not, it's not like she's using... I mean, not to, like, say that cyanide is, like, you know, any less No, cyanide poisoning is really terrible, too. Yeah. I mean, all of it's terrible, but, like, yeah. this is, like... But no, it's true. I mean, of the poisonings that I've talked about, right? So far, it's very I mean, unexpected. And polonium is worse for sure, but thallium is probably the second worst yeah. of the ones that I've talked about. Because, well, I don't know. They're all really bad. I mean, that's right, what I'm saying. Like they're, like, they're they're all terrible. You can't really rank them. But yeah, I think out of out of now like, that I think about it, I, like, but 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 what I'm saying about this one is is like if you put like choice of I'm gonna kill somebody and I'm gonna poison them. Thallium isn't something that would just normally be on the table. No. <laughs> you and, know? Like, and that might have been part of why the, the perpetrator would have used it, because they would have figured it's so rare and hard to detect yeah. that, you know, it, it, it would have been a good means to mask what they were doing. It, it would have presented as something else. I mean, I guess. And that almost happened, you know, if it weren't for modern technology that just came about, you know, the, those sort of more parochial doctors may not have uh, been able to figure it out themselves. Who knows? So anyway, this doesn't really say anything, like we're saying, necessarily about whether... I just want to make that real clear, right? About whether Sun Wai was, like, guilty or not. It's just impossible to say at this point because a real investigation wasn't done, unfortunately. Um, Because, unfortunately, especially at that time, justice was hard to get in China. Um, But, of course, now as well. Um, but people, of course, continue to speculate, right? People in, in Beijing, people in China are just like people anywhere else, <laughs> right? They are prone to speculation. Um, that's human nature. And uh, mystery sort of reigned that's for how it goes. the next, you know, 18 years or so. And here we are. And uh, so at, at, at that point, we're 2013. And finally, in 2013 the Beijing police respond after 18 years Damn, of okay. a consistent drumbeat of public sentiment and, you know, internet outrage. Um, on May 8, 2013, they issued a uh, written statement that explained that there was simply too little evidence to come to any conclusion in the Zhuling poisoning. They also specifically rejected suspicions of political influence, of course, and denounced the public's you know, sort of conspiratorial mindset in in this case. So, just like with their initial statement, nothing. Essentially nothing. Yeah. Almost worse than a no comment. You know, it just, if anything, it's just muddying the waters. But they really just haven't ever said anything about this case. They didn't really clear anything up and they kind of made it fishier. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, So, you know, the internet, um, a big part of this case, right? It, it, almost literally saved Ling's life. Um, But it was also a really big factor in keeping the investigation into this really tragic poisoning, you know, in the public eye um, for those, you know, 18 years and beyond. Uh, So starting at the end of 2005, so about 10 years after the crime occurred, the Chinese internet, especially the popular bulletin board, uh, Tanya Club, uh, just kind of blew up with speculation and discussion of Ling's case. Um, it wasn't totally clear to me why it was in 2005, but that was kind of where when it, it really, like, resurfaced. Well, is that not the 10-year, t- like, anniversary? Yeah. No, for sure. It was the 10-year anniversary. So that, that Maybe may that's have, why? Yeah, that was probably the, the main reason, I would think. Um, But there were, like, intermittent bursts of activity related to the case as well. Although, within that, what was kind of real and what was not real was very unclear. Like, for example, there were these supposedly hacked emails that were released um, that were supposedly between Y and some of her friends. 
supposedly coordinating, like, an online cover-up. They were, like, getting their stories straight to, like, cover things up, um, you know, ar- well, around We don't know time. if those are legit or not. We have no idea whether they're actually legitimate or not. There was also a White House petition. So, you know how on whitehouse.gov you can, like, create petitions? Yeah. That was created in 2013 to try to force the U.S. government to take some kind of action against Sun Wai. And while it garnered over 100,000 signatures, which is the standard, you have to get over 100,000 yeah. signatures in 30 days, and then the government is required to have some official response to it, it it was just not clear, like, what jurisdiction the U.S. government would have had over her. Like, it wasn't clear if she lived in the U.S. or didn't yeah. live in the U.S. or was she, like, a U.S. Naturalized citizen. There's just also so, like, not no enough really evidence to even take action. No, absolutely not. Are we gonna like not. go to the Chinese government and be like, "Hey, right? Hey, <laughs> do your job." Yeah, like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's uh, probably not gonna happen. <laughs> um, however, this this whole uh, thing with with the excuse me the the White House .gov petition it it didn't really go anywhere per se, but. It did help to bring the case kind of um, into the U.S. public consciousness and, and back into the wider Chinese media landscape as well. Um, so the, the general sentiment of the Chinese public, you know, seems to be that the investigators really failed Zhu Ling and her family. Um, there's this kind of pervasive notion that some kind of cover-up happened, um, but no one can really say for sure or for sure why it would have happened, or what they would have been covering up. Um, so Ling's case, though, does remain like a kind of a symbol of the corrosive power of corruption and political abuse by the elite yeah. in China, which, which, which is a, a fairly persistent theme, um, although it's tamped down fairly hard by you know successive Chinese governments, including the the current one. Although I do have to say, in the current, you know, un- under current President for Life Xi, um, there has been some modicum of official space allowed for, you know, some exposure and criticism of of corruption. For example, like the, there are some like high level generals or government officials who are misappropriating funds to buy themselves these like lavish apartments, right? And people are calling them out on it and yes. stuff? Yes. Nowadays, it'll get ca- called out on Weibo, and, um, you know, people will take notice, and then that person will get fired or arrested. Whereas, you know, may- maybe wasn't... 15 years ago, yeah. the person who put it on the internet probably would have gotten arrested. Um, so there, there's some, you know, nominal change, but it's not totally clear how far that goes or, or, or how real it is. How, how real is the, the rule of law in China? That, that's always like a big question. Um, and it has definitely changed over the years. So um, what also helped to kind of bring Ling's case back to the public eye was a new use of this old scientific technique called mass spectrometry. And um, what mass spectrometry is, it, it's basically a way to tell you how much of each element is in a sample. Okay. So it kind of like weighs the elements in a sample, so to speak. And the reason that a new technique was necessary to kind of look deep more deeply into this case is that, as I mentioned earlier, thallium testing is pretty difficult, um, especially with, with a limited sample. And because there was um, also because there was not an accepted standard against which to test hair thallium oh, samples. Right, right. See our last episode for, you know, kind of a, an ex- explanation of what's good and bad with forensic science. Hair analysis. Especially with hair analysis yes. and, and things of that nature. So um Zhu Ling's family though contacted this re- researcher named Richard Ash, who's a geologist at the University of Maryland College Park, to see if he could create a timeline of Ling's poisoning. Oh wow. And um, he he was able to do this. And and the way in which he was able to do it was with several of Ling's hairs that were saved. As I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, the hair is going to come back. Um, This this is where it's coming back. (laughs) This is it. This this is it. Call back. Uh, Marker. Call forward. Call back. This is the call back. Um, So these were sampled uh, by Ash to create a more or less true timeline of approximately when Ling was poisoned 
and by how much thallium she was poisoned at that time, uh, which is pretty remarkable that, that that's possible. Um, so Ash basically used an ultraviolet laser to scan the hair, burning off or what's called a blading particles from the surface of the hair, and then using the mass spectrometer to d define the masses of each of the elements, including thallium. Because hair grows and absorbs chemicals at a constant rate, Ash could then use these data to reconstruct when Ling was poisoned and by how much oh, thallium she was poisoned. okay, okay. Right. So, so um, he had, like, this spectrum. By the end he was done, he, exactly. he could see. Exactly. And he actually created his, his own bespoke standard for, um, for thallium poisoning in hairs. And he did this actually by using... Um, leaves as a, a sort of, um, you know, test or whatever, a model. Um, so he, um, you know, used different concentrations of thallium within a leaf, saw how it took it up and, and the, the process that it went through to get go through the, the parts of that leaf and therefore was able to kind of create a standard against which to test the hairs. And uh, he tested his standard against other known samples and things and uh, was able to, you know, really determine that it that it was very accurate. Um, again, always have to be testing a sample against a standard. If you're testing a sample against a sample, you're doing it wrong. Incorrect. <laughs> Incorrect. Something Cannot, you have to have a constant. Have to have a constant against which to test, or you're not doing science. You're doing speculation. Um, but that's not what Richard Ash was doing. He was doing it right. Okay. Uh, so he, uh, also discovered that Ling had ingested thallium in many doses over time. Mm, and this is, this is where we get to the really, like. yeah, the really like sinister nature of this. And those doses increased in frequency and concentration over time. Oh my God. And, and it gets really specific. So the analysis revealed that the poisoning began even before Ling was symptomatic. So even before late 1994. So it's sort of to me, as if the perpetrator were testing out the waters, so to speak, seeing how much of the toxic heavy metal, you know, would actually inflict a noticeable harm on Ling. Oh and then kind of ramping up to that point, right? That's evil. It is, And that yeah. takes guts. And, and a, a lot of forethought. And, I mean, th this crime was extremely premeditated. Right. Right? Um, the concentration of poisoning actually dipped... At the end of 1994, which we would expect when Ling was recovering in hospital, uh, presumably unavailable to be poisoned at that particular time. Um, unfortunately, the analysis also revealed a two-week episode of large thallium ingestion at the beginning of 1995 that elicited the second hospitalization. Which okay. is where the, the okay. real bulk of so the trauma the increase, occurred. So there was an increase of dosage, and that's why she got worse. Right. All of it matched up perfectly with the known timeline and essentially confirmed and uh, refined what we already knew. So, you know, it, it, it gives us a little bit more to work on, right? And, and in this case, there's like these little kind of flashes of... I guess it kind of adds know, to the, the profile, like the... Yeah. Of the... The person who did this. True. And if, if there were real police work being done and if it had been done at the beginning of the investigation, then we could say, you know, okay, does, for example, Sun Wai fit the profile, fit the profile or not, yeah. right? And that would be in, in, instructive in some way. But unfortunately, this case will probably remain a mystery. Um, but, you know, there, it has been marked by these sporadic developments so far, you know, so... We'll see. You know, it, it's it's funny how it kind of it, every once in a while this case will kind of resurface. Um, one thing I didn't talk about was uh, another case of poisoning in China that was sort of similar that also brought this case back up again in the media. Yeah. So, What an interesting case. It had a lot of breakthrough yeah. science in it. Yeah, and that was the other thing. A lot the of other interesting thing too. And a lot yeah. of because of this, this happened and – Research exactly. So it's it's a really fascinating case, but at the heart of it, of course, is you know that um, you know the 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 humanity of of Zhu Ling and uh, what she and her parents have had to go through, and you know it's just really really tragic, you know that 
that she and, and her family and everybody have had to deal with this uh, through all these years. So, you know, never never to lose sight of that with, you know, the, the other aspects of the case. But so it's certainly a very intriguing and, um, yeah, it's a, the, a case that has a lot a lot to it, more than you would might might think right at the beginning. So, anyway, that that was my story for the week. Wow, that's and a good one. I know, right? Um, my sources were uh, Jennifer Ouellette at Ars Technica, um, several articles from the South China Morning Post. They kind of had a, a just several about this case. If you want to look it up on their website, um, Andrew Jacobs at the New York Times. Wikipedia, of course. Yeah. Uh, the Thallium Poisoning Case of Zhuling page, as well as uh, some other pages as well. Yay! Yeah, so there you go. All right, so I'm going to talk about... So m- me and Mario were listening to Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton. Uh, hadn't listened to Hamilton in a minute, so we... Hadn't listened to your musical in a while. Just kind of put it on. <laughs> yeah. And we're, here we are listening to Dear Theodosia. Right. And I'm like, you know, she was lost at sea. Right, which I think I always kind of knew, but I don't really know anything about it other than so that. So let's get into it. If I I'm can excited. Pull this, pull this up properly. Yeah. My computer is being very slow and, and, and glitchy, and it's um, frustrating. Okay. <laughs> so Theodosia Burr. Um if you are familiar with uh, U.S. early U.S. history, um, and which, which or, you may or may not be, which you may or may not be, because we we have a lot of listeners outside the U.S. So, or um, if you're familiar with the musical Hamilton, because it which is, you probably are, which you probably are, <laughs> it is a uh, it it. I mean, not gonna lie, it's a great telling of if you want like a mm-hmm. brief uh, little glimpse into the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812 and right. the whole beginning of, of the America. The of 1800. It's it, a big... It really gives you a good sense, I think, of how of how things were then. Yeah, it, it captures the spirit of the Revolutionary Era, I believe. It does a great job. Exactly. So Alexander Hamilton, of course, the first Treasury Secretary, would have been president but for a sex scandal. Um, you know, al- almost certainly would have been president if not for that. Um, was tragically killed in a duel by Aaron, Aaron Burr. Burr, of course. And Aaron Burr is the father of Theodosia Burr, the woman that I'm going to talk about today. Right. So she actually has a very interesting life and a very sad, very mysterious death. Mm. So she was born June. Yes, she was born. <laughs> I just thought that sounded funny. She was born. Okay, all right. She, she was not uh, hatched. Or <laughs> <laughs> she didn't come out of a duck-billed platypus egg. Or she was born uh, June 21st, 1783 in Albany, New York. A lot June of this takes place. June 21st, 1783. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'll stop, I'll stop. 1789. <laughs> Monsieur Hamilton. Monsieur Lafayette. Okay, we're moving on. I could, I could, I could just it's too, sit here and do the right, whole thing. I know. So, like I said, daughter of of Aaron Burr and her mother, uh, she was named after her mother, Theodosia Prevost. Um, and I, I love the name Theodosia. It is a really cool name. It's a beautiful, beautiful name. Mm-hmm. So Aaron Burr, a lawyer, Revolutionary War soldier, and he was later um, vice president to Thomas Jefferson for a term. But they they really didn't like each other. Did yeah. not get along. Theodosia Prevost, her mother, she was actually a mother of five and married to a British officer uh, when she fell in love with with Burr. So right. she actually uh, waited to or uh, waited till her husband died before she acted on mm-hmm. on what her heart was telling her. I don't know if, if you know this, but did, did her husband die in the war? Was he, like, killed in battle? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't think so. Okay, sorry. I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> so, um, like I said, she got uh, they got married after her husband's death, and um, their daughter, Theodosia, she was actually the only child of theirs to survive. Oh. So she was raised mostly in... Um, NYC. And so education was very important to 
um, her father. Her father had a big part in her life. They were very close. Um, he he looked after her very closely. She, he was very strict. He was big on um, um, discipline in general. He kind of groomed her uh, like 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 she like a son, so mm-hmm. she could carry on their family legacy and mm-hmm. and have this huge impact on the world. And that was like his his goal for her. He had a lot of high expectations for her. Mm-hmm. She Great was, expectations, right? She was very educated. Um, really bright she had she knew um wide range of subjects except most notably for religion both her and her father Aaron Burr were just decidedly un unreligious mm-hmm. didn't believe in it mm-hmm. um she focused a lot on writing and and english uh and this was practiced through um exchanging letters with her father um they actually wrote like thousands of letters oh, just wow. interacting between each other and he would um uh critique her and s- her language right. and this then the other thing which as we were speaking about when we were listening to hamilton is from where lin manuel miranda got the lyrics for some of the songs right a lot of his lyrics are like original quotes right um stuff that they wrote to each other yeah, it was just a really good idea. I have the honor of being your obedient servant. <laughs> A dot ham. A dot ham. A dot burr. A dot burr. <laughs> so she fell in love in 1800. She married Joseph Alston, who um, was a wealthy landowner from South Carolina. Um, later, uh, when the war broke out, he ended up becoming the uh, the governor of, of South Carolina. So they had a son named they uh she named uh her son after her father. So her oh, son's okay. name was Aaron Burr Alston. Um and they had a son um a little less than a year later. So very early in their marriage. Mm-hmm. Um and he named uh him Gampy. That was his like <laughs> little like nickname. Aaron Burr's nickname for his grandson was Gampy, Gampy which oh my god. I don't know. That's so it's weird. Kind of weird. What does that mean? I don't Gampy. know. Gampy. It reminds me of the word gimpy, which is yeah. like. It makes me think of grampy. I know. It's. I don't know. It's. It's the 18th Strange. century. What do you. What do you expect? Yeah. Well, now it's the 19th century. 1800. Probably some so, random allusion to something we have no idea. I know, right? It's some kind of inside joke. We'll never yeah. know. So she. Um, this birth was actually very traumatic for Theodosia. Um, mm. It. Uh, she ended up with a prolapsed uterus. Oh, my God. And it left her in immense, yeah. immense pain. She had a hard time um, adjusting to her new life as um, just a, an obedient mm-hmm. wife uh, who lived on a, a plantation. Uh, she, so she ended up spending a lot of time um, with her father um, back in New York during his campaign and all that good stuff. Mm-hmm. So a few le- years later, in 1804... Um, that was when Aaron Burr shot and killed Alexander Hamilton in a okay. duel. So it was 1804. Right. Okay. So at that point, he was on the run. Mm-hmm. He was never actually tried for the murder, which is interesting. Because um, it wasn't technically a murder, right? Or was it, in, was really. it an illegal duel or was it a legal duel? It was legal because it was in New Jersey, I believe. Okay. They, like... Across the border. Because I know at that time it was, like, kind of a gray area, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, it was, like, not totally clear some places, if this was, like, legal or not. It was legal. Some places it wasn't. And but it had place. to be done the right way and, like, right, for the right, right reason. Yeah. So which, I'm not, I'm actually yeah. not uh, entirely sure on that. Um, but he, he never really faced any repercussions for it. Mm-hmm. But he served out his term as, as vice president. And after that... He headed west right. to establish a new country. Right. Um, it was made up of Western <laughs> North America territory and like Mexico. This was never actually going to happen. It by didn't. The way. It didn't happen. Like he was a crank. Well, he like, planned. He planned to be emperor. Right. He's like, I'm going to be emperor, and my daughter Theodosia is going to secede me as. Uh, <gasps> I mean, succeed me as it makes empress. me you know like and it, she was so excited and she traveled with him there and oh, everything really? yeah oh i didn't know she that. was a big supporter of her father yeah they're very close okay interesting so she was like going to become the the empress after he died yeah oh, wow. she supported him um both her and her husband 
um, Joseph Alston uh, mm-hmm. uh, supported him, uh, both emotionally, physically, and um, financially. Like, they, like, traveled over there and oh, wow. went to, like, oversee stuff. And uh, they, like, raised funds and sent him money and stuff like that. Because he was extremely charismatic. I mean, that's the th- thing that comes up about Burr over and over again, too, right? Like, he was a really good talker. He, yeah. He was, like... Very good at like convincing people of of his positions, but only to a point. Only to a point, <laughs> only and to a point. didn't want to really put himself out there. That's and we were you and I were talking about this. Like Lin Manuel Miranda kind of uh, portrays Burr as somebody who doesn't really want to take a leap, and he's kind of sitting in and waiting for opportunity to happen, yeah. and it's mostly based on his his childhood and how everyone he cares about has died and how is he still alive and this, the other thing. And I was thinking about this and Theodosia, uh, go, goes, uh, missing and lost at sea and he lives for another 23 years. Wow. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. It, it's, it's, it's crazy. So it made me think about like, you know, everyone who loves me has died. So I'm willing to wait for it. Like mm. it, it it's crazy. Like, everyone around him kind of did die. It's, huh. d- it's not an exaggeration. It's Interesting. Sad. Yeah, I know that it's sad. It's rough. So, like we, like we said, this, this um, empire n- never happened. <laughs> right. He it was, was never going to happen. <laughs> yeah, he was arrested for treason. Mm-hmm. So he um, went to trial, which was in Richmond, Virginia. And Theodosia, she was there with him by his side again. She was with him the whole time, emotional support, um, even though he was eventually acquitted. Mm-hmm. So then she even helps him leave the country. So he flees for Europe, and she um, helps him through that process, too. She um, raises funds and, and sends that mm. to him. She, even, she writes to the Secretary of Treasury at the time, Albert uh, Gallatin, and she also writes to the first lady at the time, Dolly Madison, in an effort to secure, like, a smooth return for him. She wanted him to come back on good terms. And so mm-hmm. she was advocating for him and sending him funds and all, and all types of stuff um, while he was in Europe. So he ended up being in Europe for four years. Mm. Um, during this time, her health continues to decline and um, it goes into a, a downward spiral once her son dies from malaria in 1812. So he was, like, 11? Like, 10 or 11. Right, because you said she got married in 1800. In 1801. She got married in 1801. So he was, like, 11. And then about a year later, he was born. So, yeah. 10 or 11. So he was a kid. Um, It's possible that Theodosia had uterine cancer at this time, but we don't Hmm. know for sure. So... Uh, like I said, uh, her father, Aaron Burr, returns from Europe in July of, uh, I put 2012, July of 1812. <laughs> of 1812, okay. um, But she's too, it, she's actually too sick to go see him, so she has to wait a few months. And she waits until December mm-hmm. to go to the journey, to go to the journey, to, to go on the journey, the, okay. the journey to go see her father. So the War of 1812 breaks out. Yeah. Her husband, Joseph Alston, um is now the governor of South Carolina and he can't come with her on, on the trip. Right. Of course. But both him and her father are worried about her. Like there's war in the Atlantic. Um, mm-hmm. she's about to go travel. So, um, and she's not in great health either. So, um, her father arranges for a doctor named Dr. Timothy green to accompany her on the trip to assure her safety. So they sail off December 31st, 1812, Theodosia Burr Alston boards the schooner Patriot from Georgetown, South Carolina. So it's this famously fast sailor. It was originally built as a pilot boat, and it served as a private ship during the war. Um, The captain, William Overstocks, also wanted to make this trip fast. He wanted to get to New York with his cargo and get out. Okay. Um, Weeks passed, and there was no word Mm. from the ship. Uh, And the Patriot was never heard from ever again. We don't know what happened to it. Uh, Joseph, her husband, died four years later in 1816, and her father, uh, like I said, Aaron Burr, went on to live for another 23 years. Wow. So he died, what, in, like, the early 1840s or something? Yeah. So, um, uh, his, his, his daughter is missing at sea, his son-in-law dies, his grand, his grandson dies, Mm -hmm. it's, 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 
terrible. So as time goes on, rumors start to circulate. All right. Um, in June of 1820, there was an article um, written in the New York Advertiser claiming that two privateers on the ship ship named uh, Jean DeFargus and Robert Johnson. There was these two guys who were like, confessed to taking over the ship. They said they took over the ship, they trapped everybody on board, they stole their valuables, and then they sunk the boat. But there were lots of details that contradicted their account. They, the two men talked about how the weather was calm all, um, the whole time, but according to log, log books from a British fleet um, traveling um, same time, same, same area, that there was a severe storm mm. um, those few days. And so they probably, there was actually multiple deathbed confessions and people saying stuff that, that most likely wasn't true. So they weren't the only people who were out there saying, oh, actually, we were there, and we sunk the ship, and this, then, the other thing. So it's part of this weird phenomenon where people will confess to high-profile crimes that they didn't commit. Right, right. There is another confession made by Benjamin F. Burdick. Um, he was also on his deathbed, and he said that he made um, uh, Theodosia Burr walk the plank. So despite the fact that Walking the plank is more like fiction than anything else. It's not, it wasn't like something, it wasn't mm -hmm. common practice. Mm -hmm. um, he said that he claimed that she was clutching a Bible before she descended into the sea, quote, without a murmur. But Theodosia, just like Aaron Burr, her father, they not weren't religious. religious. Yeah. So that didn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. um, there was another story which some people think is somewhat plausible was that um, the Patriot was at, had actually fallen, play to, fallen prey to wreckers, known as the Carolina, quote, bankers. And so they operated near Nags Head, North Carolina, and they were, they were basically pirates, okay? So they were mm -hmm. known for, like, waiting for wrecks to come up to the sea, and they would um, uh, either just rob the wreckage or kill the passengers and the crew, and then... Mm. Uh, plunder and take their valuables and all that wow. good shit. Um, I mean, <laughs> real, terrible. Real scum. <laughs> really the scum of the sea. Terrible. <laughs> like, they can't even be bothered to, like, take over a ship. They're just gonna wait until it wrecks. I mean, here's, and then no, no, no. fucking I have take advantage. I like, have details. Here's what come they would on. do. Okay, this is what they would do. So <laughs> when they couldn't go through, like, wrecks that washed up on sea uh, when there wasn't any you know, there sure, wasn't much going on. not a wreck on. every day. Yeah, right. No. They lured ships onto uh, the shoals. Okay. So on stormy nights, they would, like, bring out a horse, tie a lantern around its its neck, and then so they would have, like, so, like, sailors who were, like, way out in the sea would see, like, a light, and they will be like, oh, look, shelter. They would think it's shelter, they would think it's another ship that's, like, securely um, you know what, anchored. Though? Poor horse. <laughs> Mario! Poor, I feel bad for that horse. <laughs> Come on, I'm sure the horse drowned half the time. <laughs> well, they would, like, hobble a horse on, like, the... I mean, maybe, I don't know. Well, it was on a little shoal, but, I mean, come on. I know. don't know. So, um... So, yeah, the sailors looked, and it was, like, shelter or mm, another right, ship or right. something. So, it, but it but was, in, it was, yeah, it was a, a trick, and so yeah. they ended up being wrecked. They wrecked on the banks and so before they right. it was too late right. um, before they knew what was happening of course um, and people died so um, that's po a possibility that's something that could have happened to them mm -hmm. um, it's also said that Theodosia Burr might have been the female stranger so this is another mystery in and of itself of um, a, uh, a woman who who died at um, a place called Gad. Gadsby's Tavern in Alexandria, Virginia, October 14th, 1860, 1816. So it's said that um, a, a, quote, veiled lady um, came into the city and she was sick and she was with a man claiming to be her husband. And people um, have attributed this man being the doctor, Dr. Timothy Green. Um, and uh, she was sick and she ended up dying a short time later and they they didn't talk about their identities. They didn't okay. say who they were. So they said maybe, maybe it's possible the timeline's right. Um, it, 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 maybe it could be her. That's another theory. Okay. Um, then we have the Nags Head portrait. So I, this one's kind of far-fetched, but I think it's 
I think it's an interesting little mystery that goes with it. Uh-huh. So in 1869, physician William G. Poole treated a woman named Polly Mancaring. Uh, she was an elder, elderly woman who lived in uh, Nags Head, North Carolina. So he's treating her, and she, he notices an unusually expensive-appearing oil painting of a woman about 25 years of age on hang on her wall. And um, he says... Wow, that's got that looks exactly like Theodosia Burr, and so she's like, "What?" He he asks her about it, and so she gives it. She actually gives it to him as payment, and she claims that um, when she was young, her first husband had discovered it on a wrecked ship um, near Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Oh, yeah. Wow. So over the years, um, the physician uh, William G. Poole, he and his cohorts cohorts attempted to talk to um, the the family and authenticate Mm -hmm. the portrait, but Mm -hmm. it didn't really work out because it was so many years later and most of the family members hadn't actually met Theodosia Burr and could only really compare to other portraits that they had. Um, And that's going to be an exact. Right. And it was, and it was, the opinions varied, varied greatly. Interesting. When it comes to that. But that's, uh, that's it. That's the mystery. Yeah, there's a, there was a lot more to it than I originally thought. I thought yeah. it would be she disappeared and that's it. But there's a lot of speculation, a lot of rumors, because she was definitely a woman of stature, definitely someone people knew about. Mm-hmm. Um, it was very sudden. It was super tragic. And we don't have, we really don't have any answers. We don't know. And it was during the War of 1812. Right. There's not really any indication that it necessarily right. had anything to do with that. But this is also kind of an Occam Razor's, is that how you say it? Occam's o- Razor. O- right? o- o- what? Occam's Razor. Occam's Razor situation. <laughs> the guy's name was Occam. In that sh- they probably got hit by a storm. At yeah. The, at yeah the sea, and it sunk because there were reports of storms. In that area. In that area at the time. At the time. Yeah. Um, probably. I mean, many, many, many ships. A surprising number of ships still go down at sea at, at storm, in storms, actually. Scary. Yeah. Uh, you'd think that they would have been able to get around that at this point, but yeah, no, it's still the, You'd think a lot of things about a lot of things. I think things sometimes when I use my mind brain. Uh, thanks for listening, you guys. Yes, another <laughs> Super episode. Super appreciate it. Uh, we, in and out, in crank, and out. Cranking them out, and we're being super good this week. Getting High the, five. Getting our shit done early. Oh, that hurt. Um, getting <laughs> our shit done early. Oh, you're wearing a ring? Oh, that's why. Okay. No, that's not why it hurt. I'm always wearing this ring. This isn't new. Well, I think the ring hit me, like, right there. Oh, okay. Anyway. Anyway. Anywho. Um, um, I've got some weird shit Yes, in the you news. go first. Some weird shit in the news. Weird, weird shit, shit in, in the, the news. news. It's time. And, and, and the news. Weird shit in the news. Weird. Um, okay, so this is a CNN article that I saw that was kind of cool. And it's by this guy named Jack Guy. <laughs> Great name. Um, and the headline is, No one knows who owns the ghost plane abandoned at Madrid Airport. What? So apparently there's there have been these, I think it's like three uh, three airplanes that like no one knows who owns them. And they've just been sitting at this airport in Madrid for like years, like three what? or four they're years. They're just there? Yeah, they're just sitting there. Can we go take one? No, th- there's this thing where you they have to, like, notify the public, which they just recently did, and then they have to wait a year, and then they can sell it for, like, scrap. Oh, wow. Apparently this, like, happens, where people just leave a plane. How do you... Uh, I don't but know. it's a plane. I know, It's not right? like it's, like, a pair of shoes. It's not like it's, like, even a car that you rent, that you, like, rented, that you just, like, left in a parking lot, because you're just like, fuck it. You know, it's a plane. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a 747 or some shit. Planes aren't cheap. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, it's... I feel like if you own a plane, you wouldn't forget about it. But also... Well, what if you can't pay for it I was going to say, like, what if you don't own the plane? What if you're leasing it and you're totally underwater and you, yeah, you just, like, got a piece and, like, find a new <laughs> identity. <laughs> like, piece? <laughs> b- buy a new passport from, you know... But- how Taiwan often does that happen, and then why in Madrid? Well, um, I'm not totally sure. I think it the Madrid part, I think, is just random. Like, that's where it ended up being. But 
in terms of why, I also don't know. But I thought it was weird, so that's my weird shit. So I've got some weird shit. Well, it's it's more... Update? It is an update. Because so we talked I, about this in the last episode, right? Or a couple of episodes no, ago? No, I think we, you and I talked about it. I don't think we talked about it on the pod. A lot of times I cannot remember if we talked about something while we were just hanging out or if we did while we were talking on the pod. So, so there was a three-year-old boy that went missing. Yes. Um, his name is Casey Hathaway. Near Charlotte, North Carolina. Right, right, in North Carolina. So um, this is an article from uh, Huff, Huff, Huffington Post. And so he Huff, was actually Huff, Huff, Huffington so Post. he was actually found alive after having been missing for days, um, and he told his family members that he was uh, quote busy spending time with a bear. So mom yep. and I were talking about this because he was so he was like with other kids. This was on this was last Tuesday. So he was like with other kids. When, like, the last time he was seen, and we right. were like, that's fishy, right? Yeah. And he like, just, like, wandered weird. off? Yeah. I, I don't... This three-year-old kid just, yeah. like, into the woods? I don't know. But they said there was no sign that he had been abducted. Yeah, that's what they said. Yeah. Um, uh, he wasn't injured or anything. Um, they said he was, like, dehydrated. He was found wet, cold, and tangled in vines. Um yeah, not seriously injured. He was, quote, a little lethargic but warm when he was found. Uh, yeah, he wanted water and his mom. Aww. But basically fine. But basically, I mean, it's a, it's a After fucking miracle. After two days by himself in the woods, a three-year-old. It's crazy. Quote, he's already asked to watch Netflix, so he's good. He's good. <laughs> right. <laughs> He'll be fine. <laughs> it's like, uh... <laughs> It's a happy ending. That's crazy. <laughs> no, it kind of reminds you me. You get your kid back and he's like, yeah, I just kind of want to watch TV. <laughs> right. Because he's three. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard about that girl that they found in India. I think it was like a year or two ago. Um, she was like five and they didn't know how long she had been living in the woods. But she had like lost the ability to like speak, like human speech. And they said it might only have been like several months, but it might have been longer. Wow, that's crazy. And she had basically been, like, living like Mowgli, like, just with the animals, like, in the woods. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Um, I also didn't say my sources. Oh, yeah. I uh, used Wikipedia, of course, the Wikipedia page, Theodosia Burr Alston, an Atlas Obscura article by Hadley Mears, and an All That's Interesting.com article by Daniel Rennie. And Atlas, Atlas Obscura, Obscura, yep. Obscura. Obscura, they have a book, mm-hmm. and uh, we should look into that. Oh, that would be cool. Just putting that out there. Yeah. <laughs> one of the podcasts I listen to, um, I forget which one it is, what, one of the, like, the main guy who runs Atlas Obscura is one of the guys who's on the podcast, so I remember hearing about it. Definitely a great that. site. Great. Has a lot of good mm-hmm. mysteries on there. Definitely. Lots of cool, like... There, there are a lot of, like, um, cool, like, sites, you know, interesting sites that you may not know about, you know. So, yeah, definitely take a look on there. All right. And vi- visit our Instagram and all of our bullshit. Yeah, hit us up on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, doing the things. Yeah, yeah hit so, us up on Patreon. Um, yeah, look, look at our Patreon for some new uh, pictures and stuff of us recording and things of that. Things of that nature. Nature, sort, whatever. Um, Twitter, I just got a new Twitter handle. So you can hit me up on that, at me. Guys, today Mario texted me and was like, I tweeted at you. Like, ugh. I'm an old person. Uh, it's Mario Text 30. So if you want to check that Mario's out. Mario's from Texas, and if I'm you guys didn't Texas, know. And Steph Curry, 30, so. Oh. That's where that comes from. Nerd. Yep. Uh, and then, of course, you can also hit up our, our actual Instagram uh, at murdery thingy, right? What? At- What's murdery our, thingies are Twitter. That's our Twitter. Mystery right? murdery thingies are Instagram. Okay, murdery th- ad murdery thingies are Twitter. Okay, okay, I think we're done. We're done. <laughs> okay, that's bye. That's it. That's the podcast. That's it. That's we're done. Bye. Bye.